Welcome back. Welcome back. This is Andy, as always, and this is the Poor Pearl's Almanac. Elliot, when someone says nut to you, what do you think? My first thought is, is this a command? Hot. That's it. And then my second thought is allergies. Do you, does, does anybody have a nut allergy? Mm-hmm. My son. Matt, do you have a nut allergy? No. Okay. Just a dislike. <laughs> <laughs> just a dislike. Oh, man. These episodes uh, what... have been terrible, by the way. <laughs> yeah. It's been a real rough spell for you. Um, Matt, what do you think of when someone says nut? Mm, what what comes to the forefront of my mind? As a British man on occupied something land. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, hazelnuts are a pretty good candidate for, like... As prime, a British man, they should be. Nut, yes, you know, it, it's like in part of that reptilian part of the human brain, like hazelnuts, the amygdala. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that thing. It's built into uh, the flight of. Uh, <laughs> it's the lesser known flight or fright, or f- flight, or not fight or flight or hazel night. Sorry, that's terrible. It really was. Yeah, even by my standards, it's that's those standards are trash sorry i didn't set you up well for that one no all right so today we're talking about hazelnuts if that didn't become abundantly clear like these abundant hazelnuts that we do not have anymore to me the american hazelnut we're not talking about the beaked we're not talking about any of the other ones we're talking about the american free the freedom loving american Mm -hmm. hazelnut the patriotic the patriotic in my opinion one of the least appreciated of the the native nuts i mean According to normal norm, that all underappreciated. R.I.P. I just feel like this whole season is a never-ending nut saga. And it will never end. Yeah, just like the list of our future episodes and content that we got coming for the Poor Pearl's Almanac. Oh my god. Yeah, we're never-ending. Matt was like, Eternal. this is going to be a fun thing for a couple episodes, and he's going to be like 76 with his cane. Yeah, you guys didn't, uh, you guys didn't get the memo on Under Promise, huh? No, we never under like the hazelnut. We never under promise. <laughs> never knowingly under promised. Yes. So every episode of this series, we've kind of hyped up a specific nut as being crucial to humanity. Right? We talked about the acorn being like this really important tree for humans for thousands of years. The hickory being crucial for indigenous diets until only a few hundred years ago. Black walnuts. Uh, African American walnuts, because we are a PC around here. And you can sign up at footfinder.com and get a 10% discount on your bag of feedy black walnuts. You heard that here first, folks. Footfinder.com, promo code NORM. Promo code <laughs> From... <laughs> NORM. Is that real? Uh, it could find be. Out. You, this is the only one way to find out. Um, if it does work, please let us know, just for the record. I want to know this now. So we did all that, and then we, we talked about the chinkapin and kind of its per, uh, potential significance on the landscape right and uh today we're hyping up the american hazelnut now this is kind of the lowly ignored hazelnut of the globe the stuff you see on the shelves nutella uh that for most americans that's like other than like hazelnut flavored coffee which doesn't have any hazelnut in it that's about the extent of where most americans know hazelnut right and that's that's uh european hazelnuts Outside of that, the American hazelnut or hazelnuts in general have generally been kind of absent from like the human diet or the American diet. But really, it wasn't always this way. Bum, bum, bum. And we bring you today's episode. Much like our good friends, the acorn and the hickory, the hazelnut was also at one point one of those like most important wild food crops in North America and arguably the world and there's a really good reason for that what do you think makes the hazelnut so special matt well the fact that we're doing an episode on it today obviously well yeah i mean our podcast is like a kindergarten classroom like every nut is special here we're like the mr rogers tree crops hello big nuts little nuts and nuts of all shapes colors and sizes won't you be my neighbor Aw. I could see Elliot in the little sweater vest. That could be fun. That'd be a rough neighborhood. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, first off, why isn't the American hazelnut, like, in our diets? And the answer is pretty simple. Their nuts are 
small, and they're pretty difficult to process compared to European hazelnuts. A part of this is that the European hazelnuts were domesticated much earlier, or in how we think of domestication, like from the Western perspective, which kind of gave them a leg up on Americans or the, the beaked hazelnuts. Beaked like a bird or like billed like a duck? Uh, it's like build like a duck or be, I, I don't know the difference between beaked and built, but it is one of those, like it literally has like the leaf, not the leaves, whatever they're called right on the outside of the, the nut there. They look like a quack quack. I'm doing it with my fingers. You guys can't see this. So I obviously. think of like a beak is like kind of hooked and maybe like sharp and can be used for. I don't know. Let's find, let's fighting. find out. I feel like a yeah, bill is like, like it's, a it's, bill is like flat and like. Not it's necessarily like an, spoon shaped, but it's got it's got that spade like is spade like species specific su surface area, or is it form specific? You know what I mean? No, I don't. <laughs> I'm already confusing the audience yeah. on hazelnuts. Uh, okay, let's let's wind back here a little bit. Despite the fact uh, the hazelnuts are smaller, more difficult to process, they're still actually really important for the future of hazelnuts as a crop consumed across the globe. And that's because of uh, the fact that they're resistant to a native blight that's called Eastern filbert blight. Now, before we can, di before we can dive into its potential today, we kind of need to, as always, back up. I'm not even going to mention Scrat. Don't even think about it. Just tell me how far back are we going this time? Is it like a few hundred years? Well, actually, this time we do have to kind of back up to the Ice Age. So, And there we go. There yeah, so we go. Didn't we fucking we, call it? There Jesus Jesus He's talking Christ. millions of millions of years. So you might recall that as the polar caps began to recede after the last Ice Age, you would imagine that the first trees that work their way north are those fast-growing early succession species, right? Despite the fact that hazelnuts produce nuts, they're actually a part of the birch family. Twist twist i know and that seems obvious once you start looking at like the leaves and the catkins and the female flowers on the same bush and all these other traits that you're like ah yeah it doesn't really fit in with any of the other like nuts the reason why i'm bringing this up is that the birch family is basically entirely at least as far as i can think of uh early succession species and hazelnuts are one of those but the big asterisk that makes hazelnuts a big deal is that they're the first protein-producing trees that work their way up towards those polar caps after the last ice age. So, you know, they moved north. Humans and or the animals that eat them followed them. Basically, what I'm saying is that either directly or indirectly, the reason that humans moved across the landscape was because of the hazelnut. Because, again, as we'll talk, they produce nuts very quickly. They're very easy to access. Uh, and then again, they feed a lot of other animals that then we can hunt. So they kind of check off a lot of boxes for us. Through this process, we as a species learn to manage landscapes to grow tons of hazelnuts basically wherever possible. We did talk about this at one point during the Indigenous Ireland episode a few seasons back. Yeah, and how could anybody forget the island that was settled by a man who put bears on boats to bring them with them to wherever they went honestly it still sound it still sounds crazy i feel like someone lost a bet and that's how that happened but it is a reminder that the irish are mostly better than all of us Seriously. they make better whiskey they have better iras like <laughs> you say lost the bet i say they got exiled and made that shit work mm -hmm. but honestly like once you see once you've seen someone put a bear in a boat are you really gonna mess with them it's because that memory fades. It's you a just... flex. Yeah. yeah. So let's let's focus in on the American hazelnut, despite the fact that, again, hazelnuts are around the entire earth and were like crucial in our development as like an entire species. The American hazelnut can typically be found in savanna thickets, on the edges of forests, and occasionally sprouting in prairies across basically every part of North America, east of the Rockies. Because of indigenous land stewardship, the native hazelnut was at one point one of the most dominant species in our ecosystem across the entire continent. And there's even evidence of like intensive human management of the hazelnut for at least 7,000 years here in North America. But due to different changes in uh, land management, colonization, so on and so forth, 
you know that whole story. The hazelnut is basically at this weird point where it's facing what could be considered a functional extinction, comparatively speaking, due to population decline. And like I can recall seeing them in the wild like a single time. I feel like all the hazelnuts I've ever seen are like intentionally cultivated. Yeah, and this isn't surprising for a uh, really sad reason that we're going to talk about in a minute. Oh no, it gets sad. It gets sad. Oh no. But first, commercial. Hey there. Is your name George? Do you use foundations to funnel money to organizations to bypass tax regulation? Are you recognized as maybe funding radical leftist movements across the globe? Well then, this commercial is for you. Specifically you, George. My name is Andy, and the Poor Proles Almanac is looking for you. Come fund our program. We've got boomsticks. We collectivize the energy of the sun with plants. If this sounds like an ad made explicitly for you, go support the Poor Proles Almanac at poorproles.com. Well, that was that made Matt feel much better, that commercial. <laughs> yeah. He's doing great now. Feeling not I'm sad fine. at all. Let's yeah. get sad. Yeah, so let's get sad, everyone. Despite being an early succession species, we don't see the American hazelnut in many parts of eastern North America. I feel like this is just going to be terrible. Yes, you're not going to love this. First, to start framing this, put this all together, we have to really talk about where they should be. Hazelnuts can handle most conditions. They're kind of universal. They can grow in dry, sandy soils. They can grow on the edges of wetlands. They handle fire well, like they, they sprout back from fire well. They can basically deal with most things that exist in North America. It's one of the only bushes I've ever seen in the wild growing up a crushed rock embankment on a small stream where even like weeds struggle to grow. That's what's up. Yeah, they're they're beasts. And they can handle part shade, full sun. The only difference really is like how much nut production they'll have. Historically, they have taken over those poorer soils, whether it's crushed rock embankments or sandy landscapes that have been stripped of topsoil. But Matt, what other plants take over poor soils? Oh, man. It's invasive, isn't it? It is. Winner, winner, Nutella dinner. Okay. Buy it. Yeah, Nutella dinner. <laughs> <laughs> you got a problem with that? Mm, I don't. Hmm? My brain doesn't. Right. My gut, probably. Oh, I love Nutella. I'd say I'd say it's more after dinner, but that's just me. Okay. Nutella and fluff. That's what happens when you have a six year old. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't can't do fluff. But back to the hazelnuts. So we lost hazelnuts off of the landscape and we got what back? Like is it autumn olive that you've been talking about? Is it not weed? Yeah, the the all the fun species are invasives. Not all. A majority of our invasives. Uh, are early succession species that thrive in poor soils. So like when you're sitting in like a Lowe's parking lot and you're like picking the autumn olives because you're like, hey, it's fruit that exists. There's tons of it. And I can like do something with it. And that's great that you can do that. But also you could be just picking like hazelnuts instead. Like fruit's nice and all, but come on, not even close. So it's not an olive like I thought it was at all. No. But I'm still learning forevermore on this podcast. So autumn olive is not an olive. I'm going to put some autumn olives in your salad. See how that goes. I'll, I'll try it as long as it's not mulberry leaves. What does what an autumn olive taste like? Um, they're not like... to derail this. So here's the thing about autumn olives. They, they're, the flavor profile swings significantly based on when you harvest them. If you harvest them just a little bit too soon or even like just as they're starting to get sweetened, they're like super, super tart to the point where you can't eat them. But then they get like almost like a, I guess like a huckleberry-ish flavor, like without the blueberry part of it, if that makes sense. If you don't know what that means, then like a gooseberry-ish kind of flavor. They're not particularly good. I don't, I mean, I don't, they're not bad, but I, I think. People hype them up for some reason. I, I don't know. 
Anyways, that's one of the major invasives that we have to deal with. And then, of course, there's like the Tree of Heaven uh, here in New England, Black Locust. Like Matt said, Japanese knotweed. And if you're talking about those more wet sites where hazelnuts would be, Phragmites, which is just taken over everything that it can get its fucking paws into. Like I said, the big problem with like these invasive species in particular is that they kind of just really take over any early succession location. And that kind of acts as like this really shitty buffer to like the natural ecological succession chain because it doesn't really support the development of a natural ecosystem. So like if you take the time to like look under like an auto- autumn olive tree that's like 20 years old, you're typically not going to see any like native trees sprouting underneath. You're going to see like some grass and like that's about it. And further, like the trees that I just listed, the three trees, they all fix nitrogen, which in many ecosystems like where we live or I live rather disrupts the soil nutrient profile that native species have relied on for thousands of years. So like obviously nitrogen fixing isn't inherently bad, but it's worth considering how that impacts your local ecosystem and then makes it more difficult for those natives like the American hazelnut to be able to move in and like kind of go through their natural succession, do all the important stuff that they're supposed to do for their ecosystem. Just to kind of harp on this just a little bit more, those trees, like if we were talking about like where I live, what exists for nitrogen fixers? Here in Eastern Massachusetts, there's really not that many. Alder is basically the only tree that is native here that fixes nitrogen, and it's pretty rare, stays in wetlands areas, and then groundnuts like apios. That tends to stay, again, also in wet areas, and while it's nitrogen fixing, it's not like a massive tree. It's a, it's a little vine. Those are very isolated examples of nitrogen fixation here in eastern Massachusetts. Not really... You know, having all these nitrogen fixers across every highway doesn't reflect any natural ecosystem. Yeah, so basically the ecosystems that we're talking about, they haven't really evolved for nitrogen-rich soils outside of like wetlands and riparian zones. Yeah, exactly. So you're you're fundamentally altering these ecosystems. And um, one of the really interesting things is they actually have looked at the microbial life around like autumn olive. And it's shown that the, the, the microbial life has changed because of those trees or those bushes. The other thing is that, like, while there are trees like the hickory, you know, that can handle a, a wide range of soil types, right? It's important that we have a diversity of trees, even if, if some trees can handle it, doesn't mean everything that would live in that ecosystem can. So it's not getting the full benefits of that ecosystem type. So for like example, the American hazelnut, which again, we've mostly wiped off the landscape. It's still around, but it's not nearly at the scale it once was. At least 131 species of caterpillars are supported by the American hazelnut alongside a number of birds. Now, again, that's just 130, that is 131 species just for like a shrub that grows about 10, 15 feet tall. And, uh, you know, that that's a small piece of a very big landscape that now is like mostly gone okay but what about the autumn olive so getting pollinator data on invasives is really difficult not because it can't be done but because it just doesn't seem to be an area of like a lot of research for some reason but one paper i did find on it um studied it because of their interest on how they produced so much fruit so like why are they so good at producing fruit and seeds and becoming super invasive it listed 47 different pollinators so like what's that uh a third of the hazelnut and half of them were non-native or considered pests. And of those that were named, of those 47 total, about 20 of them had only been identified on those bushes less than three times, while a lot of the other ones, the 27 or so, were identified 10, 15 times. So it's kind of like, was that like a, an abnormal reading? Does that, was it an aberration? Did they actually use the autumn olive? So that uh, 47 different pollinators number might actually be significantly less. While the American hazelnut is wind-pollinated, bees often collect their pollen when possible, even though it doesn't impact pollination. So even though the hazelnut doesn't even fit the same profile, it offers all these benefits for caterpillars, plus pollinator services, even though it's not even pollinated by bees. Way to go, Matt. You got Andy all fired up about invasives, not hazelnuts. We could set them on fire, Elliot. 
I mean, is it fire beaver time? That would help the hazelnuts, wouldn't it? Guys, it's fire beaver time. I'm getting the diesel out. Hell yeah. Actually, if we burn the landscape, invasives, 99% of invasives are not co-evolved for fire. So, like, literally, fire beaver time solves a lot of our problems. Like, I'm not saying, like, we need to do the meme thing where the guy, like, shows up with the Maltov and he's like, how'd you get that so fast? But it wouldn't hurt is what I'm saying. Uh-huh. My pyro stage ended years ago, but, I mean, if you caught me at the right time about a decade and a half ago, I'd be so excited to hear you say that. <laughs> Funny enough, Matt's about a decade and a half younger than you, so it's a sign. Oh, man. All right. Matt's Time to I'm getting the diesel either. out. <laughs> he already said it. He did. Uh, obviously, he's kidding everyone. He would never do that. Yes. Ever, and Matthew. Now that this is being played at one of our three arson trials. Hello, Jerry. Hello. I'm, I mean, well. <laughs> we only wanted the hazelnuts. Come on, doing it for the nuts. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like the reason why I'm bringing this up is invasives really perpetuate the loss of our natives, particularly early succession species. This isn't as big of an issue, although you could go into how it affects oaks and hickories and black walnuts and all these other trees. But because the American hazelnut is this kind of aberration when we're talking about nut trees, the invasives are so impactful on their development and their place on the landscape. Besides the ecological benefits, hazelnuts do produce nuts. Like I, like I said, hazelnuts do produce nuts within just a few years, and in some cases up just as short as two years, versus like black walnuts, which can take 12 to 20 years really before they start producing. Further, hazelnuts will produce up to 200 pounds of nuts per acre in a wild setting. So that's like, Matt set the landscape on fire. There's a thicket of hazelnuts like running across the property. You're looking at about 200 pounds of nuts per acre. That's pretty cool. And also, what also makes it really interesting, or cool, I guess. I feel weird saying cool. Am I getting old? Yes. Uh, yep. <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, is that they're also really early season producing nut trees. So you're getting a really protein-heavy crop early as August before any other nuts fall on the ground. There's really just nothing else on our landscape that can really compare and producing that much in that few of years especially when we're talking about protein and also adding that it's the first nut crop to fall in the year and really it's not enough just to say it's a nut crop so while the hazelnut is a nut just like everything else that we've been covering in this season it's really important to look at its caloric composition it's almost 26% crude protein. Yeah. Now that's higher than black walnuts at 15%, acorns at 5%, pecans at 17 hickories at 17 and chinkapins, I think, is in the teens someplace, if I recall. We, of course, I can't remember it now, and I didn't write it down. Okay, so all I'm hearing is these nuts protein powder, the brand that I'm going to start. It's going to be a hazelnut formula, all right? That means nut powder for nut power. Now that's a slogan. You got to put that on a bumper sticker. Yep, that's that's the one. This episode not brought to you by fires and diesel. I mean, if you use the nut powder for nut power, you could set as many fires as you want. Yeah, I feel like D's nuts is the origin story for Florida man. For Florida. Oh yeah. I mean, that's that's just free marketing. I'll take it. <laughs> Yeah, so we're going to transition a little bit. I want to talk about one of my favorite parts of the series that we've been doing. Are you guys ready? Is it math time? Oh, my God. He he does this for work all day. Don't shit where you eat, man. Keep that at work. I mean, you're dangerously close to crossing the streams, and if movies have taught me anything, that's bad. Yeah, it's math time, boys. So um, while we often consider that caloric production to be the easiest tool to measure the importance of a crop... Protein calorie for calorie is the most important long term for you know sustainability on the landscape, right? That's my little preface before we get into this caloric content per hour of labor. When we measure the hazelnut against like hickories or walnuts, it kind of falls right into the higher end of the middle of the pack. So if you guys recall, walnuts are around 600 calories an hour. The hickories, when you're grinding them, are like significantly lower, like 200 an hour. And um, the hazelnut ends up right below the walnut, around 592 an hour. So that means for an hour of 
picking, harvesting, and processing hazelnuts, you get about 600 calories. So that's average, right? Average above average. Not not bad, not great. But unlike all the other nut trees that we've talked about, and the thing I keep harping on is that it is a small shrub that occupies an entirely different niche while also producing calories with a quicker turnaround from planting. Like, that is just such a big deal that, like, I, I don't think we can overstate it. And it also puts out a similar caloric production, I guess, per hour uh, compared to like white oaks. And this again, without having to wait a decade or more for that productivity. So it's like the perfect prepper garden plant. Worried about the uh, outbreak of war in the next two years? Hazelnuts. I mean, shit, man. If I keep watching the news, I think it's the next two weeks. I feel like the doomsday clock is reading like, 1150 or something i don't know but they got to bring that back that was exciting no it's still there we're just afraid to look at it it's like you know when you ran up a credit card bill real high and you're just like don't open the statement (laughs) that's the doomsday clock right now like just don't look it's bad we've probably already hit midnight but before we keep going quick commercial break go listen to us like sell you mre buckets or something hey we're taking a quick break in the episode to remind you that you can get a whole lot more information from poorproles.com. On our website, we have access to our supplemental reader for the podcast, which provides more depth and context, as well as thorough citations for all of the stuff we talk about in the show. You can also sign up for our newsletter, which updates you about limited releases, such as various nursery stock that we sometimes sell through the Poor Proles website, as well as updates about new merch that we have. You can also support the show through that website, poorproles.com, where you have access to our Patreon and our Substack to get early releases for articles and episodes. Now, if you enjoy the show and are just looking for even more audio content, go check out Tomorrow Today, which just wrapped up season one, or tune into the Gastropocene, which is a project of myself and Dr. Aisha Khan to discuss the way our diets have driven the Anthropocene and what it looks like to use our diets for good. Now, back to the show. Welcome back. The war is the war. Is the war. It's like a rose is a rose is a rose. I guess it kind of sucks. But Come on. What is what what is it good for? What what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. No? Okay. Yeah. Matt. Good God, man. <laughs> uh now, unlike hickories, hazelnuts aren't a good option for boiling, but in terms of like a non-boiled nut option, hazelnuts make up for their small size with easy shells and the lack of need for leaching like acorns. Okay, so no boiling. We got no sacks of nuts. I don't know what that means. Hang on. It literally means no sacks of nuts in my toilet because people will put them in the top part to leach the the acorns. Okay, so no boiling. No sacks of nuts in the top of my toilet to leach them. Uh, no cooking in lime. No commercial grade nut crackers. Mm-hmm. I mean, hazelnuts sound pretty good for like me. I'm pretty lazy. Yeah, and not that you're lazy, but yes, you're right. The biggest yes challenge- covers yes covers both, man. <laughs> yeah, I I'm trying to be nice here. I'm gonna be in your state in a few weeks. I'm just you know making sure I don't get shot. <laughs> so the, the the biggest challenge in harvesting the hazelnut is twofold. First, they're preferred food for like basically everything that eats nuts in the landscape because of the reasons we just talked about. And that usually means that we can't wait until they fall to the ground because that just doesn't happen. Now there's a second problem, and that is finding the nuts on the tree because their husks around them are green, just like their leaves. So it makes finding them difficult. When nuts hold on to the trees after the leaves fall, then uh, harvesting can be really quick. And actually, if they've sat on the tree for a longer period of time, they're even easier to husk. So, like, you can find them quicker, you can process them quicker. That 590 figure that we were talking about before, when they've been able to harvest, and according to studies, when they're able to harvest them later in the year, that figure jumps to 4,000 calories an hour when that harvesting is done in, like, late October. Okay, and from what I've learned in this nut saga of a season that we have going on, that sounds like burr oak territory, kind of like a contest. Exactly. It seems like something we should be breeding for. You know, it does, doesn't it? Historically, humans were cracking hazelnuts on a stone with a pit or with a wooden mortar and pestle, 
and indigenous people in North America have done so for at least like 12,000 years. We've already talked about the fact that like the hazelnut itself is not particularly unique to North America. So indigenous people from Ireland to the Pacific coast and everywhere in between on both directions, they've always harvested hazelnuts. Often there are techniques to help deal with the fact that you have so much competition. So one of the techniques that's really cool is that they would basically, instead of harvesting from the tree, they would actually harvest from squirrel catches. So instead they would just like find where the squirrels were hiding them and take them from them. <laughs> brutal. Right. Pretty, pretty brutal. What would Norm say about that? Norm was probably the one who discovered this technique 12,000 years ago in a cave in Georgia. That's an option. Another option that people have done historically is bury inedible nuts away from the trees that are producing them. The goal would be that the squirrels would be attracted to the big pile of nuts on the ground instead of a big tree. Uh, and that would give you more time to go get those nuts. And the fact that squirrels in particular are such a big consumer of hazelnuts, many indigenous languages actually, the word for hazelnut is often like some kind of collection of words that includes squirrel in it, which is pretty cool. Like it'll be like the squirrels, whatever. Yeah. The, so squirrels and hazelnuts are like chums, we'll say. So I envision a future where a hazelnut is the common ground we can use to strike a chord of peace across the globe. You did it, dude. You fixed racism. Give them the old hazelnut. Me and Scrat doing it together. I mean, it sounds like Scrat used to be a slave. After what you just said. Yeah, uh, I mean, he got work it's pretty free hard. Free labor. Free labor. Much like the Ozark chinkapin, which we just talked about a few weeks ago, the sand hickory, which I'd brought up as a potential breeding hickory, and even the bur oak, which we've talked about quite a bit on the show, there's evidence that selected hazelnuts were identified and moved across the continent. The example that I'm going to use based on a lot of this research is still really preliminary, uh, is beaked hazelnuts out in British Columbia. Now, while they're beaked hazelnuts, I think it kind of like points to like a very common thread that we've been seeing, which is that people are identifying improved varieties in the wild or from breeding projects that indigenous people were doing, and then moving them with them as they traveled across the landscape. So we've got this disjunct population of beaked hazelnuts in British Columbia. These locations, unsurprisingly, where these trees have been found, were uh, located closely to indigenous communities, many of which still live there. In the Pacific Northwest, that beaked hazelnut that I just mentioned is often found in thickets alongside the Pacific crab apple. So much so that like, when these plants were found together, they were considered to be basically like markers that indigenous people lived there. In the Midwest, in the East Coast here, closer to where all three of us live, the hazelnut is often found with sumac and elderberry, and these can often reflect the edges of historical burning patterns. And that's often, you know, historically been guided by landscape changes, which really managed how landscapes were burned. We're going to have to start a new theme song for when Andy gets to talk about disjunct populations and math. Yeah. It's like a lamb and a tuna fish. I guess we could get some math core music involved in an almanac. That's not weird at all. You know what? A little little clip from this episode as the like intro uh sample to a math core song would go pretty hard. I don't even know what math core is. Like I've heard of it, but I don't know what it is. I imagine it's like techno rock or something. Is that right? Well, I might get roasted for this, but my understanding is that it's like pretty close to Midwest emo. Ah. Uh. Math core is Midwest yeah, emo. It's, it's indie rock with weird timing. Yeah. Oh, okay. They're, they're musicians. <laughs> they're freaking nerds. They're actually musicians. They and I'm not afraid of them. <laughs> Matt's staking his ground right now in a cabin in the woods where no one can find him in uh -huh. his bags of tannerite and diesel, apparently. Mm hmm. Nope. It all comes together. I did not mean to mm hmm that one. <laughs> okay. Sure, you didn't. Um, it just came out. It just came out. <laughs> so so um, while there's this population I just brought up of beaked hazelnuts, there's also another disjunct population of American hazelnut that was discovered only last year in the Ottawa district. Now, unfortunately, the research that has come out on it is really rudimentary. 
So there's really not a whole lot to say about it at this point, but you know, I'm hopeful that uh, we'll continue to learn more about these populations that exist outside of the native range and could point to some uh, indigenous management and improvement projects. Man, disjunct. Too much junk in the trunk. Nice. Man, that's awful. Yeah, it's not nice. Yeah, yeah Matt. <laughs> that you is and beautiful. Andy, you and Andy need to take a little break. You're starting to pick up each other's mannerisms. Oh, he loves it. So earlier we mentioned the Eastern Filbert blight, right? And how it was attacking these European hazelnuts. Now, this disease is caused by a fungus called Anisogramma anomala, which I probably mispronounced. But all you need to know is that it leads to the death of European hazelnuts within 5 to 12 years, while our native good friend American hazelnut just gets like cankers, so it's like fine. One of the things, much like the American chestnut that they've been doing, is they're backbreeding into these European hazelnuts, American genetics. Now, this has been going on for breeders in North America for quite a while now, although honestly progress has been slow and not enough folks have really invested in this breeding. Fortunately, next week, we're going to talk to one of them. To fully put in context the dynamics between European and American hazelnuts, of the 200 cultivars that are used for commercial production, only two have any importance that are American, and that's Russian Winkler. The big two. The big duo. The Winky Rush. I mean, it really sounds like a buddy cop TV show from the 80s. Mm -hmm. Jan Rush and Robert Winkler together again on the mean streets of Chicago. Get down. Get down again. He's stealing bits. That's Pablo Francisco. Yes. Throwback. All right. So one person who's been working on this research is Dr. Thomas Molnar over at Rutgers. He's actually worked to collect hazelnuts from across the country to develop a nursery of almost 1,900 seedlings. And um, these seedlings are from 128 different seed lots. And the idea was to catalog as much genetic diversity of the American hazelnut as basically has ever been done. His research, in my opinion, is really worth checking out. Hint, hint. Yeah, he's saying that's who next week's interview is with, in case you missed the hint, hint. Smooth. Hint, hint. Smooth. Right? Shameless plug. Listen to the episode, fuckers. So this doesn't mean that the only value for American hazelnut is specifically because of its genetics to give other species its resistance. Despite limited interest outside of Rutgers, American hazelnut shows great promise as also an oilseed crop. Part of its benefits versus the European is that it has better cold hardiness, and it does produce as oil that's considered as comparable to European hazelnuts, despite the fact that there, again, hasn't really been any breeding or selection work. If you've never had hazelnut oil, it's delicious, first off. Second, it's high in oleic acid, and it's higher than most other vegetable oils, and it's very similar to like an olive oil in this sense. Yeah, and oleic acid is extremely satisfying to most human constitutions, and I, I mean, I bet cooking with hazelnut oil is probably pretty good. Is it, Do you know if it's overpowering in flavor? I, I don't know. I've never done it. It's amazing. I love it. It's got like a little nuttiness to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like it's almost like a walnut oil, uh, if you've ever had that. Nope. It's good. It's like adding a subtle bit of like nuttiness to olive oil. It's like yeah. the best way I can describe I bet it. That would be, I bet that would be pretty good with chicken. Yeah. Exactly. Research assessing hazelnuts for oil production, however, has pointed to a different direction in terms of breeding selection. And basically what their conclusion is, is that what's more important than what we had talked about in terms of breeding earlier is increasing the clusters per square meter. So like when I say that, I mean like the the nuts have these like little clusters that they're in. And the more you get per square meter on the tree increases the total oil production per tree. So instead of like focusing on getting bigger nuts on the trees... Almost 80% of the oil production variance in their studies was accounted just based on how many of those clusters existed. What that means to me, at least, is that there's really two different focuses of breeding projects that there should be in this, trying to bring like American chestnut or uh, American hazelnut into like production as a potential food crop, oil crop. First is that easy late harvest for nuts to be harvested. And then the second one is to have those higher nut cluster densities for oil harvesting. Okay, so let me put this into layman's terms because I'm the layman. We need 
high clustered nuts that bust late. I mean, that's going to take practice breeding for sure. Gross. <laughs> I'm just talking about nuts, baby. Yeah. Lastly, while this episode has been focused primarily on the American hazelnut, it isn't the only Amer uh, hazelnut native to North America, as we just talked about the beaked hazelnut. That one's also common to North America. It tends to stay on the West Coast and then the going north through the Midwest. And there's other ones with smaller footprints on the landscape. In reality, when putting when we start putting together that this episode, it became really apparent that there's really not much at all written about the American hazelnut. And little has really been done to even try to identify potential cultivars around hazelnuts. So I guess like my point really is that there's a lot of potential still for the American hazelnut. And it's really an area I'm focusing on growing out some selections. And again, because of that short turnaround time where you can plant a, a nut and two years later you're harvesting, if you're doing selective breeding on and putting some like decent selection pressure on like a a hundred trees, a hundred bushes, you can start to identify and clear out some pretty decent nuts pretty quickly. So this is like in terms of like a breeding project, it's a really good choice to kind of focus your your efforts on. And it's something I again I am doing a little bit of work on. I have some selections that I'm working with and I'm hoping to be able to share some of those in the future. Now, like Elliot said, we do have Dr. Thomas Molnar joining us next week. If you just cannot wait, you are fired up right now about hazelnuts, and I wouldn't blame you, go subscribe on Patreon because that episode is up there right now. And if you feel like this was a lot of information and hard to kind of follow along with us, go check out the corresponding article on our Substack. The link is in our show notes. And um, all the cit citations, uh, sources, graphics, all that cool stuff is right up on there. Yeah, all the charts and stuff. You can see all the numbers he's talking about. The big freaking tables. Yeah, I show these guys charts and they get so mad. Pounds of nut per acre and calories and all that. Crushed nuts that are boiled, acreage, and squared, steeped, steeped steep black walnuts that are cubed. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, so hopefully you guys enjoyed this. I had a lot of fun doing the research. It was really fun to make Matt and Elliot bored. And, um, <laughs> I drank you know, hazelnut coffee all week getting ready for this episode. Hell yeah. There's no it's... hazelnuts in there. None. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was all corn syrup. Just a memory. 100%. Just, it's the essence of the hazelnut. They like grew it near a hazelnut tree. Like Basically the same thing. Alex Jones, they say they're communists, but they're not communists. They're just living a commune. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be selling hazelnuts to... Alex Jones is. <laughs> they taste like hazelnuts, but they're not hazelnuts. I was going to say, that sounds like the market for American Nutella. <laughs> if you come out with that and I'll sell them these nuts, nut powder, dude, we got, we're, we're rising to the top, baby. Cream oh, rises, yeah. nuts fall. That's a bumper Boom. sticker. Done. That's what's up. That is the bumper sticker for the episode. We are done here. Good job, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. <laughs>